Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to The Simple Truth. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off. I know I was out last week because, uh, well, our government, the DOT, has certain regulations that the trucking industry has to meet. So I had to work last Sunday to help our company meet DOT standards. So I'm back now, better than ever. Thank you for joining us. We're in Luke 19. We're going to continue in our survey through Luke's letter. Uh, as he wrote it to his friend Theophilus, we need to remember that. Um, this is uh, like an investigation into the life and times of Jesus. And Luke is writing this as a letter to explain it all to his friend Theophilus, who heard some stuff about it, but Luke wanted to put in order and detail and, and tell the story of Jesus plainly and clearly so his friend could understand exactly what was going on. This is Luke part one. Luke part two is the book of Acts, which we'll get into right as soon as we're done with this, since we've already been through John. So without any further delay, let's ask the Lord's blessing and start. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. Bless it to us and open us up to hear and see things from you, Lord, that we've never understood before, Lord. Uh, as uh, Psalms 119.18 says, Lord, uh, open us up that we can see neat and wonderful things in your word. We thank you for it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So first is the story of Zacchaeus, which we've all heard probably growing up in Sunday school. The story of the short man who couldn't see Jesus, so he climbs a tree. Let's go ahead and read that. So verses 1 through 10 says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he stood, I'm sorry, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus is on his way back to Jer uh, Jerusalem, and he passes through Jericho. He didn't have to, but he did it anyway because he had an appointment here. One person. And it seems like these one-person appointments have profound uh, standard-setting effects. It's one person. Kind of like when you see uh, vengeance running wild on the streets and, and, and uh, riots and stuff. And one person gets up and says, but I'm not going to do that. I choose to forgive. And that just disarms and rattles the whole society and calms things down when one person makes a decision to do that. Um, right here, it's, Jesus didn't have to go through Jericho, but he did. Because he knew Zacchaeus was there. He wasn't a very popular person being a chief tax collector. Which might be another reason he kind of tried to avoid the crowd. Uh, he might have gotten a little beat up in that crowd. Um, the bottom line. Zacchaeus was in a despised and hated profession. Uh, he still was a human being though. And he still was a child of Abraham. And Jesus points that out, that hey, you know, he might not be the most popular guy, but still, he's one of Abraham's kids. And he is just as much deserving of forgiveness and restoration as anybody else. We need to remember that because sometimes we get off on, the, on a tangent or on the wrong side of the coin thinking, well, how bad that person is. And sometimes we even broaden it to, oh, how bad that group of people are. And we get into things that we shouldn't get into, like racism. Um, 
which is a complete fallacy in its own because both the Bible and science agree that there are no races among human beings. We are one human race. It's a lie that we're being sold when we're told that there are different races and, and we can have racism and form different opinions and hatreds towards people. That's wrong. We're all one human race. We're all God's children. We're all deserving of forgiveness and restoration, just like this chief IRS agent. So he still was a human being and descended from Abraham and needed salvation. This shows that no one has gone too far to be saved. The only sin that keeps you from Jesus is the rejection of Jesus. But do you see? Zacchaeus was looking for Jesus. That's what set him apart. That's the way we should be, looking for Jesus. When people are looking for Jesus, he's not going to hesitate. He'll make, he'll make a journey around where he needed to go, and he'll find you. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. If you, if you seek the Lord, he will be found. Let's go through 11 through 27. So back in verse 11. The parable of the Minas. So, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten Minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded those servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little have another, I'm sorry, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit. You reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. <clears throat> you knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that it may, that of my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. Notice he didn't take away the ten minas. The man still has them. Verse 25, But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you, that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Very interesting portion of scripture. Notice that they did not receive their reward until after the kingdom came. I know many of us Christians are looking for some kind of reward or something good for what we do now in this life. But don't be surprised if you don't receive it now. Don't think of it as an odd thing. That's normal. Remember, the king went away. Our king has been gone for 2,000 years now. But he's coming back. Rest assuredly, maybe after the cross, after the age of grace. So what do we do in the meantime? What did it say to do? Let's read what it said again. Verse 13, so he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas and said to them, do business till I come. I think in the King James it says occupy. If you remember that verse from the King James, occupy till I return. So don't go charging up a million dollars on credit cards thinking the Lord's going to come back soon and you can get away with it. Don't sell everything you have and move to the hills and wait for the Lord thinking 
He's just going to come back and, and that's it. You, you can't do anything else. The Lord said, occupy, do business, trade, plan for the future. Or Because if you fail the plan, you're planning to fail. Occupy, do business. Be the best steward of all that God gives you. The best steward that you can be. Steward of what? Steward of your time. Steward of your finances. Steward of ministry opportunities. Steward of the work that you have to do. The work that he allows you to do. Etc. So look at your life. Take a stock of it. Evaluate it. Are you being the best steward of what he has given you? Now that requires us to first acknowledge that nothing belongs to us. Not even our life. Not even the breath we have. The beating of our heart. It all belongs to and has come from God. And we owe it back to Him to be the best steward of everything that He's given us. That's what we do. Okay, he's given it to us. How are we using it for His glory and for His purposes and responsibly uh, as He would use it? What does verse 14 say? Let's read that again. Verse 14 says, But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So when Jesus leaves, imagine uh, the religious leadership saying, uh, No, we really don't want to follow Jesus. We want to do it our way. We don't want to submit to Jesus. Well, God forbid we should submit to Jesus, right? God forbid a judge should give a a, a convicted murderer, a Bible to help them out in jail, right? But no, we have organizations like the Freedom From Religion Association suing judges for helping people out. It's obvious that the world has done them no good and Freedom From Religion has done them no good. Maybe they need a little bit of Jesus. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think so. They told God, we will not accept Christ, is what they're saying in that verse. We don't accept your Messiah. Okay, we're not going to submit to him. Rejecting Jesus got these people, what they get? Killed in the end. Remember the very last verse? Bring those servants who didn't want me to reign over them before me and kill them in front of me in my presence. That's what rejecting Christ got them. Rejecting Jesus got them killed. Now how well can you live in God's kingdom if you're dead? Not very well, right? Rejecting Christ got them killed. And they didn't reign very well in the kingdom. So don't be surprised if you don't receive your reward here. That's normal. We are promised to reign with him when he returns. That's all over the book of Revelation. In chapter 1 and chapter 5, and at the very end, we reign with Christ when he returns. Not now. This is not the world God has intended for us to reign in. It's the next one. In this world, we're intended for suffer, per, suffering and persecution. Um, for now we are servants and we should be ready for persecution even unto death. As 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 12 says. I'm going to turn it real quick. You can if you'd like to. 2 Timothy 3. 10 through 12 says this. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, Paul is talking, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's on this side of the kingdom. That will Amen. not be on the next side of the kingdom. I promise you that. Let's read. Let's go back to Luke 19 and read verse 26 again. 19 and 26 says this. For I say to you that everyone who has will be given will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. 
So don't squander your life away in the things God has given you, or it will cost you when you stand before Christ. He has given you things. You are accountable for how you um, spend the time, for how you do your work, for how you handle ministry opportunities. Uh, because we will stand before Christ. Just a refresher on that. 1 Corinthians talks about that judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Yeah, if you thought that by accepting Jesus you were free from all this, no, we still have to stand before him and get judged. First Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Let this sober you up a little bit. Paul says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So there you go. When we stand before Christ, everything we've done since we've been born again, all of our opportunities, the way we've handled what God has given us, or the way we've squandered what God has given us, whichever category it falls into, will all be brought up before him. And then he's going to put all of that into a fire to purify it. What comes out of that fire is going to be either our reward or our loss, depending on how we handled what he has given us. Like I said, let that sober you up. Time is not eternal. Time will end. You only have a certain amount of it. We need to be spending that time the best we can for his glory. Our goods, we need to be spending them. Whatever we have, our interactions with people need to be spent wisely. Let's move on. So Luke 19, let's go on to verse 28 through 44, which is kind of long, but we're going we're gonna to digest it all. Starting at verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, as he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, whereas, whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, What are you loosing it? Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall tell him, you shall, you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent <clears throat> went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were losing the cult, the owners of it said to them, Why are you losing the cult? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on the cult, and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent on the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had been saying, um, all the mighty works they had seen, saying, "Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest." And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, "Teacher, rebuke your disciples." But he answered and said to them, "I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out." Now, as he drew near. He saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you where your enemies will build an embarkment around, your surround, around you, surrounding you, and close you in on every side and level you, and your children within you, and your children within you to the ground. And they will leave not 
and it will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The triumphal entry, this is called. It's talked about in Zechariah 9.9, which I did not mark any of my verses, so I'm having a little time finding them. You can turn there, Zechariah 9.9. says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. Here Jesus fulfills that. I think I have one more. Psalms 118. If you go to Psalms 118, we're going to talk about verses 19 through 26. See if this talks about the Lord. Psalms 118, starting at verse, I think I said 19? Yes. Or 9. 19. Verse 19 says, Open to me the gates of of righteousness, I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So all that pertains directly to the Lord. He is the chief cornerstone. What that means is the capstone, the final stone, the, the last stone to complete the building, the ornate decorative one that goes right on top, the capstone which they had discarded and lost track of until the end of the building. Then all of a sudden, as they were looking forward, they found it because it was discarded. They thought it was unimportant until the very end. And they realized, oh, wow, that's the chief cornerstone, the capstone. What I want to focus on here is in verse 24 of Psalms 118, it says, This is the day the Lord has made. I know we like to make a song about that. You know, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, blah, blah, blah. Um, but this is, and talk about every day as being the day that the Lord has made, but that's not what this is referring to. This verse is referring to the exact day that the Messiah rode into Jerusalem on the cult, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. It is the day that the Lord has made, a specific day. I know we've gone over this before, but I'm probably going to go over this again. Hello, Andrew. Because the Pharisees knew this was a messianic psalm, they told Jesus' followers to stop saying this. Stop saying these things. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because that's referring to the Messiah. So he wanted the Pharisees wanted to say, Oh no, no, don't don't say that, because he's not the Messiah. And, and they were wrong. What verse 40 say? If you go back to Luke 19. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. This was ordained of God, that these people should praise the Lord, that this psalm should be fulfilled, and nothing was going to stop it. And if everybody kept silent, even the stones to fulfill this psalm, creation would cry out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save now. This was the day Daniel predicted. It is exactly uh, the 1, 173,880 days since the command went out to rebuild Jerusalem in Daniel 9.25. You know, we can reference that real quickly. Daniel 9.25. says, Know therefore and understand that 
from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. So a period of exactly 69 weeks of years. If you multiply that out with the Babylonian calendar that they were under at the time, with a 360-day years, it equals 173,880 days. But they switched to another calendar, the Gregorian calendar, later on. Some people hypothesize and say some weird things about Mars passing close to the Earth and actually slowing it down from a 360-day year to a 365-day year. Um, I'm not sure about all that, but somehow there was a definite point in time when the calendar went from a, a nice, smooth 360-day year to the more rough 365 and a quarter day year. Um, so how do we calculate from when the command went out to now? Well, during the reign of our tax disease, um, it, they were already in the Gregorian calendar, and it was March 14th, 445 B.C., that the command went out to rebuild Jerusalem. And if you multiply that out, the years from 445 B.C. to 32 A.D., uh, you get 173,740 years. And remember, you don't count a year for zero year. There was no zero year. It, was, it went from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., there was no year zero, so you only add actually 31 to that 445. I know it's a little tedious, but it's important we get the math correct. If, when you multiply that out, that gives us, one, like I said, 173,740, so we're a little short. Um, if you add in the leap years, because now we're under the Gregorian calendar, that's another 116 days, that brings us up to March 14th. Okay? Um, if you add... But Jesus didn't walk through there on March 14th. He walked through exactly 24 days later, which puts it exactly, if you add those 24 days from March 14th to April 6th, exactly 173,880 days from when the command went out to rebuild Jerusalem to when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. The exact day was foretold by Daniel. This was the day the Lord has made, according to Psalms 118. And more importantly, what did Jesus say in verse 42? Saying, if you had known, even you especially, in this, your day. This was the day. And they should have known it. And he held them accountable for it. Because right after he said the things that make for your peace. It was Jesus right there. But they are hidden from your eyes. And because they missed it, 38 years later, Jerusalem was leveled. And again, not one stone was upon another. Um, I'm going to turn the phone around for a second and show you some slides here. This one is all the math and everything about uh, Daniel's weeks. I don't think I can hold it still enough to get a good shot, but... There they are. The math is down there at the bottom where you do all the math and calculate it out. And that brings us exactly to the time of 173,880 days from when the command went out to when Jesus walked in on the triumphal entry. The whole 69 weeks of years was fulfilled. But because they missed it, Jerusalem was leveled. This is an actual photograph of stones that are still there today that are the remains of stones that the Romans threw over the side, over the wall up here, where the temple was above here, threw them down. They're still there today. Those stones that cry out, we are the testimony that 38 years later, I want to check those out, the stones in Jerusalem, that Jesus was talking about when Rome came in and leveled it. And incidentally, According to historians, no Christians were killed in there because they had listened to the warnings of Jesus and split when they saw the armies coming down and starting to surround Jerusalem. The Christians left. They recognized what was going on. It could save your life to listen to Jesus. Let's read the last few verses in this chapter. 
verse 45 to the end. There's only like three or four verses. Let's pick up on verse 45. Luke 19, verse 45. Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let me note... If Jesus walked through our churches in America today, would he find our churches houses of prayer? Or would he find our churches dens of thieves? Would he have some cleaning out to do in the leadership because of gimmicks and tricks to grow the church, false doctrines, blatant sin, Deals going on behind closed doors with mega church leaders and government officials? Excessive indulgence in the church? Or would he find churches living like Christ, dead to themselves but alive unto God, not afraid to get dirty in working in the mud to rescue one sinner? People with a reckless faith because to live is Christ and to die is gain. So there are two main churches, one of the flesh, which is unoffensive, it's popular, and the teaching tickles the ears and promotes living well here on earth, and it's all about you. But there's another church of the Spirit that crucifies the flesh, which is very offensive. In that you can't save yourself. For when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. It's an unpopular church. In that there is only one way. Not all ways will get you to heaven. Only one way. To get to heaven. And that is the eternal cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. To wash away and forgive sins confessed to Jesus. It doesn't tickle the ears in that it's not all about you, but it's about Jesus, not us. That's the true church. And I wonder today if Jesus came to our churches, what would he find? Would he find teachers teaching to have faith in faith that you can do this? If you just speak the right words, if you just confess the right thing, you can have what you want and do what you want. Is that really the message Jesus came to teach and preach and, and that he died on the cross for? Or did he come to save sinners? And did he tell us that we need to be crucified as he was, at, at least in spirit, as Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, the life which I now live, by, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. It's not about us. It's not about us. That was, we witnessed that this week when a man whose brother was killed went down and forgave the murderer. Gave her a hug and said, I forgive you. That's what the church is about. Selflessness. Not selfishness. That's the difference. So I would encourage everybody, take the word of God back to your church and hold it up as the standard. What, Which church are you sitting in? What doctrine does your church preach? Is it grounded on the word of God? Teaching that as the verse we read, that all those who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution? Or are they teaching a false doctrine about health, wealth, and prosperity here on this earth which Jesus never pro uh, promised? He said he went away to go receive his kingdom as we read earlier in Luke 19, but he's coming back and it's in that coming back that we receive our reward and reign with him. That's what he's promised. 
that's what you can depend upon. Because if it's for now, if now's the time we reign and have prosperity, then there's a lot of people in Iran, Iraq, China, North Korea, who are being persecuted brutally, who have been lied to. Or the other is true. They're being persecuted for the truth. Because Jesus did promise that those on this side of glory will suffer persecution. But you got to live godly in Christ Jesus in order to have that privilege. If you're not living godly in Christ Jesus, don't expect persecution. Expect health, wealth, and prosperity. A little rough, I'm sorry. I'll calm down a little bit. The Lord's coming back, folks. And the point of this message I want to get across is don't squander the resources He's given you. Let's use it for His glory. Let's let's not fizzle out. Let's go out with a bang, giving our lives for Jesus. All that we have, serving Him, being like Zacchaeus, running and climbing a tree, doing whatever we can to get to Him. Having that anxiousness, I just got to see Him. I just got to be around Him. And then watch what He does. Because when you seek Him, he says, I will let myself be found. God's a master at hide and seek, and he loves just to say, here I am. You've been looking for me? Here I am. And he's, he died for that opportunity to say, here I am to you. And he, 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 he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again, that we can have life in him. It's up to you. It's your choice. You give your life back to him, and he will give you eternal life, or keep your life, and you like those on the outside when the Lord said, bring all those to me who didn't want me to reign over them and kill them in front of me. That's all I got for today, folks. Let's read chapter 20 for next week. And Lord bless you until then. Bye.